views of the German city of Jülich, central Nazi strongpoint before the 9th Army's advance to the Ruhr River. On 3rd December, Jülich was still part of the enemy's principal defenses east of the Ruhr. Farther north along the west bank of the river, infantrymen mop up in the shell-torn city of Lienich, increasing the Allied bulge spreading out from Aachen. A church, apparently taken for an Allied OP, comes under heavy Nazi artillery fire. German dead give mute evidence to some of the heaviest opposition of the Allied winter offensive. Linich, occupied 3rd December, secures for the 9th Army an area of eight miles along the western bank of the Ruhr River. Great port of Antwerp following the long battle to open the sea approaches to its harbor facilities. A large portion of its great docking and unloading equipment is ready to receive Allied cargo. Engineers speed drainage and port reconstruction. Retreating Nazis left most of the installations in working order, but such things as lock gates and bridges were blown up. The port is to be used jointly by the British and American transportation authorities. The first liberty ship is led through the mine-swept waters to its berth. These berths, numbering 178, have basins covering nearly 26 miles of dock frontage. In peacetime, Antwerp handled up to 80,000 tons of cargo a day. In 1937, considered a good year, more than 100 vessels, totaling 25 and a half million tons, entered the harbor. Of such importance, therefore, as Antwerp, that some military experts suggested that the port was one of the objectives of the powerful Nazi counterattack from the West Wall. An army of port workers paid by the Belgian government is prepared to handle the great cargoes convoyed to the Western Front. During peacetime, railroads leading out of Antwerp had a handling capacity of about 15,000 cars a day. Air Corps films of planes of the 8th Air Force attacking Nazi targets on the Western Front early in December. December, 400 Nazi planes intercept an attack on Rhineland rail targets. Our airmen claim destruction of 34 enemy aircraft against our loss of 11 bombers and 7 fighters. like rocket planes, the ME-163. The plane has a top speed of 600 miles an hour. Its motor has enough fuel to run for about eight minutes. Annapolis, Macaulay Pennis. A big name for a little mosquito, but during the Sicilian campaign, that malaria-bearing spotted wing KO'd the equivalent of two full infantry divisions. That's why Air Force's personnel on Corsica is pitching into mosquito control with a vengeance. On Corsica, August is a significant month. 
that Napoleon was born there one August doesn't bother our GIs. More important now is that it's the favorite birthday of the modern Corsican killer. In quiet waters, the female mosquito lays her eggs. Soon these hatch from wrigglers to tumblers to dive bombers. Drainage is one method of eliminating these insect menaces. On east coast lowlands, shunned by Corsicans as mosquito badlands, are operational bases for American fighter and bomber groups. Troops manning them must be protected against malaria. Oil on water chokes and kills mosquito larvae. In six months, 42,000 gallons are sprayed this way. Sure death for the spotted wing babies. Commercial Paris green mixed with lime. Hand-operated dusters film the drainage ditches with this larvicide. An answer to problems posed by large areas. An A-20 bomber capable of spreading over one ton of Paris green each trip through a Bombay hopper and a Venturi opening. A trapdoor, controlled by the pilot, regulates the flow of dusting mixture into the Venturi, which sprays it behind the plane in flight. Agitator blades break up lumps for even dusting. An oversized funnel helps load the hopper. Out buzzing mosquitoes at 10 foot levels on their home grounds. Calling cards of 160 tons of Paris green during summer months, warn Annapolis the Yanks are gunning for them and control measures pay off on Corsica. From last March, cases of malaria had dropped over 50% by August, when it's supposed to be open season for the spotted wing. This means you. Each GI here is responsible for his own malaria discipline. Atabrain won't prevent malaria, but it may prevent the symptoms. Pills away, Captain. In other words, don't get caught with your pants down when Anopheles is around. Smear it on. You can take it, but Anopheles can't. This doesn't go with every mosquito net, but the bars come in handy when Anopheles is on the prowl. The aerosol bomb spray can kill every mosquito in here within four seconds. The net will do its job if it's tucked in securely success of any malaria control program depends on cooperation from the average GI. Don't be number one on the bite parade. Air Corps films of the wrecked remains of a B-29 near an advanced base in China. All but the tail gunner of its crew of 11 were killed. In nearly all B-29 crashes, the tail assembly has remained comparatively intact. Taking off 21st November for Omura, Japan, the 20th Bomber Command Superfortress left its runway at 0200 hours without takeoff lights. Slow in gaining altitude because of its load of bombs and gasoline, it crashed into a rice field one and one half miles from its base. From Saipan on 25th October, B-24 strike at Iwo Jima in the Bonin Islands. Targets are airfields and harbor facilities. Phosphorus shells seen at right center and phosphorus bombs released into the bomber formation from high-flying interceptors are typical of Jap anti-aircraft tactics. Each streak marks the path of a phosphorus pellet. On the whole, this Jap weapon has been ineffective. It's so widely employed, however, that ordnance in the field studies captured types with considerable interest. At a bomber base on Saipan, a group ordnance officer demonstrates the assembly of a captured Jap 32 kilogram phosphorus bomb. The side fins rotate the bomb for greater stability. Three and one half pounds of picric acid bursting charge are contained in the tail cone and in a steel tube running the bomb's length. The canister itself holds 198 steel pellets filled with phosphorus.
A test demonstrates that combat crews have underrated the range and explosive power of the Jap 32 kilogram bomb. A 250 kilogram bomb of nearly the same type is also prepared for detonation. It's charged with 750 pellets. The 32 hurls pellets over an area bounded by a 300 yard radius. A 400 yard radius approximates the pellet dispersion of the larger Jap bomb. Lieutenant General Sir Oliver Lease and Daniel I. Sultan arrive for Allied staff conferences at Michinaw. Under discussion are the campaigns closing in on the Irrawaddy River ports of Katha and Bamo. Beginning in November, the drive included river crossing operations south of Michinaw and a combined push by British, Chinese and American forces to forge a ring around Jap units defending the key Burmese cities. Starting along the road to Bamo on 17th November, an infantry regiment has about 110 miles to go before attaining its objective. En route, they pass equipment abandoned by British and Chinese troops in the 1942 Burma retreat. Near Kazu on 20th November, a bamboo bridge is crossed and a stream forded as pack train continues due south toward Bamo. The machete is employed to provide a clearing in the jungle for an airdrop of food and supplies. The cargo planes come over on 24th November. At this point, the Americans have driven south to Dali, Burma, 90 miles below Michinaw. The replenishment of rations is the signal for a belated Thanksgiving dinner in the heart of the Burmese wild. Meanwhile, American observers aid Chinese forces in plotting an advance beyond the Daibing River, 30 miles north of Bamo. 75 millimeter pack howitzers are dismounted and taken across in native canoes. The presence of strong enemy forces during an earlier phase of the advance in the Daibing River area necessitated a swing over into the hazardous Sinlunkaba Hills. This maneuver was turned into a flanking movement bringing elements of the 38th Division to within 10 miles of Bamo's eastern escape route. Bamo encircled by Chinese troops. The systematic reduction of the city's defenses begins. One of the key objectives of units advancing on the city from the east is Bamo's major airfield. A wedge is driven in the enemy's lines. The attack is spearheaded by dive bombing American P-47s. The GI still photographer in the foreground was wounded 20 minutes after shooting this phase of the air assault. The targets are dug in Jap fortifications. Following up the 10th Air Force sorties, a Chinese regiment moves up to take a heavily defended enemy position in a Muslim cemetery. Bamo falls on 15th December after 28 days of siege. 